governments and math societies around the world trying to draw attention um, to uh, significant problems, mathematical problems, um, related to the planet Earth. Um, so it's my great pleasure to invite Professor Mark Wallace to give the, uh, this public lecture. Um, <clears throat> so Mark, I'll just give a brief bio. Um, Mark graduated from Oxford University in, in mathematics and philosophy. Um, he got his master's degree in artificial intelligence at the University of London. Um, you can correct me if any of this is wrong. Um, uh, his PhD at Southampton University. Worked for a UK computer company, ICL, for about 21 years. Uh, then took a position at Imperial College in 2002 and then finally became Professor of Information Technology here at Monash in 2004. Um, Mark's been a NICTA Research Fellow um, over the past few years um, and now he's currently, I think last year, became CEO of Opturian, yes, um, uh, which is a um, which is a commercialization wing of NICTA whose mission is to um, commercialize their optimization software platform. Um, and Mark has made significant contributions to the design and study of techniques and algorithms for optimization and their integration and application to solving complex uh, resource planning and scheduling problems, um, some of which he will be talking about tonight. Um, so would you please help me welcome Professor Mark Wallace. Anyway, thanks very much for coming out. <laughs> I'm a long way out of the centre of Melbourne. Um, I'm really excited to be giving a talk about something that is... Oh, that's working. <laughs> that is both technically interesting and um, interesting in terms of application impact. It's something which is immediately relevant for, for a lot of people. Um, this being a public lecture, um, Tim said, well, there could be a whole bunch of uh, school children here. Keep it very simple. Um, I don't see a lot of school children here. <laughs> but it is very simple, so I apologize to, to, uh, to the very sophisticated audience I think I've got in front for giving a, a very, very simple overview, simplistic perhaps is the word, of a, of a number of issues around the transport problems um, in Melbourne and Australia. So there's a kind of political message here. We can do things cheap without doing them nasty. They can be cheap and nice. Um, so a lot of you in the rush hour this morning were there at, at 9 o'clock and thought, well, maybe on another day I can go earlier. Um, let's try going at 7 o'clock. And it's still rush hour. Um, so that really, rush hour is the wrong, wrong name for what happens in modern cities. You have a rush three hours. Um, and things aren't getting any simpler. So if you look at the predictions for the growth in traffic on the different major freeways around Melbourne, um, we can go back up by 91% predicted for 2030. So essentially what is currently a, a major problem um, is going to get even bigger. And that's the prediction. So we go from a 3 billion costing a congestion problem to a 6 billion problem by 2020. So you may as well just get out of your cars and walk if you want to get to work in 2020. So that's the prediction. Um, We've got a solution, it's a cheap solution. Um, and there are actually people on the top of that truck, amazingly enough, a lot of them. I can't think how it's still functioning, it hasn't disappeared into the sand. So there is a planned solution, um, our good government has given to us, and let's see if we can get this arrow to appear. These things are sent to try us. Bingo. So this is the government publicity uh, advertisement for the East-West Link. And this wonderful uh, closing the gap between the East Link and uh, the City Link, going smack through the north of Melbourne disappearing underground, luckily, um, for a while. The cost, again, is um, 
So th this phase of the project is about six billion. Um, and of course, it has to go further in, in order to join up with the, the Western Freeway. So it'll be, end up being something more like 15 billion. So I guess we we'll either pay for the six billion for the congestion or six billion for the road. But at least once we've paid for the road, then it's there forever. So it's, it's not six billion we have to pay every year. But if we actually look at the measurement of the traffic flows, there's, there's a larger flow from the, the south west than there is from the, from the east. So in some sense, the choice of, uh, of building the initial phase up at the top, the uh, joining from the east link, is probably motivated by all kinds of things apart from the optimizing the traffic flows. So that's a quote from uh, Nick Economou, um, senior lecturer at Monash. There's more votes in moving voters' cars than moving trucks. But Paul Mees has a stronger statement. Um, a new road is not going to solve the congestion problem. Lots of new roads are still not going to solve the congestion problem, not necessarily. And the question is, what is the congestion problem? So the predictions made in 2007, so, so based on just expanding population and increasing wealth, is that the um, congestion will just increase. The number of um, vehicle kilometers is just going to keep on increasing up to 2020. But a later study just looking at fuel purchases, fuel sales by BITER, so this is the Bureau of Infrastructure, Transport, and Regional Economics, is actually looking at a much slower increase, and not an increase at all in some parts of Australia. So the actual number of vehicle kilometers here per capita, if we look at Melbourne, is actually decreasing. Um, obviously, this, this graph is not starting at zero. I hate these graphs that start right at the top, so it's a kind of exaggerated effect. But um, we see that the predictions of, of a linear increase may not be true. So it's quite a, a risk to, impact, to, to invest six billion in a new road to solve a problem and you're not quite sure what the problem is. Well, in terms of what new roads do, um, I really don't need to say this, but uh, of course when you've got a, a long, complicated route to get down the peninsula, you're going to get less people going. They're not going to go for a two-hour trip. But as soon as you make a nice, fast, straight road, people are going to go for a short trip and so you're going to get twice the number of people taking the, the road. So you're simply going to increase traffic by increasing the number of roads. Also, if you've got a road where you've got a, a kind of congestion and a bit of a blockage, and you just decide, well, let's make it bigger, then all you're going to do is just move the congestion from one location to another. So there's a whole lot of ways in which you can build roads and actually not cause a problem, but just move a problem. But the extraordinary thing is that it's even possible, without any increase in traffic at all, to build a new road and actually make every single journey take longer. And this is something that probably a lot of the people in this audience already know. But anyway, I'll go through it. So we look at a couple of types of roads. So most roads take longer when there's more traffic. So if you've got 60 cars per hour, just a car every minute, it might have short travel time. But if you've got a car every six seconds, things are getting a bit congested, so it's going to take a bit longer. And if you've got a car seconds, then you've got real congestion, so things are really going to go very much slower. So the travel time on a particular stretch of road is going to increase with the number of cars per minute, with the occupancy of the road. On the other hand, there are other roads that are, that are either large enough or small enough that it doesn't matter how many cars there are, it's not going to make any difference. It's going to be equally fast or equally slow. So there's two different ki kinds of roads. Some roads are more sensitive to the actual occupancy, to the congestion, to make it slower, and some less responsive orders. Uh, variable on So here we've got a, a, a very simple road network. We've got a start and an end, and we're going to look at the traffic flow from the start to the end. And there's two routes from start to end. We can go via A or via B. And each of those routes has two legs, two, two bits of road. Um, type 1 road from start to A and from B to end is one of these type 1 roads where the time is going to increase cars per minute. And for simplicity, we'll just say that the travel time is the cars, number of cars per minute divided by 10. So if there's 400 cars per minute, then the travel time is 40. 
type 2 road is one of those constant ones where it doesn't matter how many cars there are, it's going to take the same amount of time, 45 units of time. So let's assume there are 400 cars per hour which want to go from start to end. Uh, the journey time really depends on how those cars choose the routes. So if all cars go, go the same way, it's going to take longer. So let's take a scenario one where all the cars start uh, go by A. So if all 400 cars go by A, so there are 400 cars going from start to A, so the time required is 40 to get from start to A. We go from A to end, it's just a fixed time, 45, independent of whether it's 400 cars or 1,000. So the total time to get from start to A to end, to get from start to end by A is 85 units of time. There aren't any cars going by B. It would only take 45 minutes if they went that way. So if you've got a, a more equal spread in scenario two, 200 cars go each way, then going from start to A takes just 20 units of time, and A to N takes 45. And start to B takes 45 units of time, and B to N just takes 20. So under scenario two, the time taken on both routes is just 65 units of time. So if you're in scenario one, drivers can save time by just switching from the route by A to the route by B. They can save 40 time. So they will. So that's not a steady state in terms of people will tomorrow take a different route. On the other hand, once we've got to scenario two, the driver can save time by changing routes. So that's what we call a user equilibrium. So it's a kind of long-term pattern, traffic pattern when all the driver's preferences are set. And that's a reasonably stable state that you compute when you're investigating, exploring what kind of uh, flows there are going to be on roads, given different origin and destination demands across. OK, so that's a user equilibrium. And that holds in scenario two. So now we're going to add a new road to this road network and it's going to be a type 3 road, which is one of these fast roads. It doesn't matter how many cars go on it. It's just, just going to take one minute of time to get from A to B. So now we've got a route from start to end by A. That's one of the original routes. We've got the old route from start to end by B. It's the second route. And now we've got an extra route, a route from start to A, A to B, and B to N. So we've got a third choice. Um, I've just introduced a road which is a new road, a one-way road. Um, could have made it two-way, but nobody would really want to get from B to A. But anyway, for the simplicity, we've just kept it as a the new road is just one way. So there's just three routes from start to end. And if we look at the, um, uh, if we've got 400 cars on route um, one going by A, then as we see in the diagram at the top, we've got 400 going over the top. The, the travel time is 85. By route two, where there's no cars going, the travel time would be 45. And via route three, where there's still no cars going, that would be uh, 40 plus one, just 41. So time of one from A to B, time of zero from B to end. So if we look at what the drivers are likely to do, and drivers on route one are going to switch either to route two, which would save them 40 units of time, or to route three, which would take them 44 units of time. Drivers on other routes might not switch, but there aren't any, so it doesn't really matter. I've grayed that bit out. So it's only really the top two rows that matter. So the fact that drivers are prepared to switch means that we're not in a user equilibrium state. This is not a steady state traffic pattern. So let's increase the number of drivers going. Um, oh, oh, this is scenario two. We just got uh, 200 going via route one and 200 going via route two. So in this case, both Route 1 and Route 2 take 65 units of time. Route 3, so we've got 200 cars going from start to A, so the time is just 20. And then a time of 1 from A to B, and then 20 again from B to N. So the total time for Route 3 would be 41, if there was anybody on it. So if you look at the, sw the switching now, uh, drivers going from on Route 1 can switch to Route 3 and save themselves 14 units of time. 
24 units of time, I beg your pardon. Um, and from root 2 to root 3, they can also change 24, save 24 units of time. So that's, again, that's not a user equilibrium state. Drivers are going to want to change routes. So scenario 2 is not a user equilibrium scenario. So people are going to start using this new road, which goes from A to B. So let's suppose that uh, 200 of the 400 cars now have switched to this third route. So they're going start to A to B. So now we have 300 cars going from start to A, 100 going on from A to end on route 1, 100 cars going from start to B, and 100 of, of those, or those 100 will go, uh, then go on from B to end, and then 200 cars going from start to A to B to end. So we, we get a total of 300 cars going from B to end. So under this scenario, the time taken via route 1 is 75. That's 30 plus 45. The same time is taken via route 2, 75. And via route 3, all these ones using this extra road now take 61 units of time. So it's still the fastest route. So more and more drivers are going to switch to this new route 3. They can switch from route 1 to route 3 and route 2 to route 3, so we're not in a user equilibrium state. So finally we get to the point where there's 400, all 400 drivers are taking the new route. And now it takes 40 units of time from start to A, 1 from A to B, and 40 from B to N, so it takes 81, so it's really quite a long route now. But if they'd taken route 0, if they switched to route 1, that actually takes 80, would, have, would take 85. So it's 40 plus 45. And similarly, going via, route, uh, via, via B, route 2, would also take 85 units of time. So nobody wants to switch. We have a user equilibrium state. Everybody's now using their optimum route. So we've added our new road, and it was a very fast road, type 1, type 3 road. Originally, every journey took 65 minutes in scenario two. Now, every driver takes 81 minutes. That's a great new road extension. So, as a lesson for non-mathematical decision makers, adding new infrastructure doesn't necessarily relieve congestion. It can just make things worse. So, don't let politicians make the decisions. Let's get some mathematicians making the decisions. <laughs> okay, so what can we do? Don't just add new roads. Well, I want to look at a series of things that we can do to um, make journeys quicker. Improving signals at traffic junctions. Ooh, coordinated traffic. Routing. What have we got here? I beg your pardon. I'm sorry, I have to take a short break while we work out what's happening here. Tim, this is your regular lecture theatre. So it's just for you? Oh. <coughs> Brilliant. Oh, you just touch okay. the screen. The I've got to touch the screen a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I apologise. Um, so improved public transport is a way of relieving congestion. Um, Improving communication, so vehicle to vehicle communication and vehicle to roadside. And finally, I'm looking at integrated freight transport. Oh, and also finally, automated vehicle control. <coughs> so let's first look at the traffic signals um, improvement. So I've just got a, a cartoon which is rather un PC, so I, I apologize for the language in this cartoon. This light always takes forever. I'd like to smack the idiot who designed this intersection. Hi, who the hell are you? I designed this intersection. You're right, I should have just made the light shorter. Never mind hours of simulation testing I did. Never mind that this intersection interacts with its neighbors in complicated ways and it took me a week to work out the time sequences that added, avoided total jam. Clearly I'm a crappy engineer and you have a better solution. Go on, show me your proposed timings. Not a great response. <laughs> Get the hell off my hood. This is obviously an American cartoon. Before I start driving and fling you into the traffic. You can't. The light's red. When will it change? Tuesday. <laughs> That's what traffic lights feel like. 
very often to me. Anyway, it's not always bad. So, so Monash has got some, some traffic light systems that work reasonably well. And if I can get this um, video to work. This is a John Gaffney video about the M1. Also known as studs have been installed on all freeway entry ramps and the freeway corridor. Studs are installed in pairs positioned at three locations along the ramp to accurately calculate volume, density and speed of traffic entering the freeway. They also help to measure queue lengths along the ramp. Traffic signals will switch on when the traffic detectors on the freeway indicate that freeway traffic is heavy. Traffic signals help create more space between vehicles joining the freeway, making merging safer and easier, and reducing the potential for slow to break down. So this is really the heart of the video, this uh, next scene. Traffic congestion on the freeway often results from a surge of traffic entering the freeway at any one time. This sudden reduction in speed creates stop-start waves which reduce freeway capacity. And if we look at the video, we see the cars now changing lanes, blocking up the next lane, and then moving to the third lane, blocking up that one. Stop-start waves can slow down several kilometers of freeway traffic. It often takes the whole peak cycle for the freeway to recover and for traffic to flow normally again. And the point about this is not just to introduce signals on one ramp, but all the ramps must have signals. Will automatically switch on as the freeway needs capacity. Ramp signals operate as part of a coordinated control system, talking to each other and working together to make sure that once you are on the freeway, you keep moving. The coordinated system helps to prevent slow breakdown by balancing the number of cars entering the freeway at any one time. Entry ramps closest to the bottleneck are the most congested. The coordinated system works to stagger any delays across a number of entry ramps to balance inflows along adjacent ramps. There may be times when the wait on an entry ramp is a little longer. This means the ramp signals are working together to manage traffic flow and prevent flow breakdown further downstream. Okay. So this is a kind of diagram of um, the flow against the occupancy on the freeway. So on the left, we see how it was before the ramp signals, the coordinated ramp signals were introduced. And so as the occupancy increases, so there are more and more cars per minute, um, the flow increases until it reaches a certain point of, of occupancy beyond which, as you have increased occupancy, so more cars per minute, um, more cars arriving, <laughs> more occupancy, uh, the actual flow, past a point will reduce. So with the introduction of the, the ramp freeway the signals, you have this increased flow with increased occupancy and then it's the occupancy gain beyond that level where the flow starts to decrease is prevented by the signals stopping additional cars arriving on the motorway. So essentially the motorway is occupying, is performing much more of the time near its, its peak performance. This actually uh, reduces the number of crashes, so less stop starts, increases the average speed um, from about 50 to about 66, and increases the vehicle per hours per lane from around 1500, which is the maximum before the um, signals were introduced, towards 2000, which is really the target for a motorway. Okay, so that's a bit about the, the traffic signals. Um, I want to talk about coordinated vehicle routing next. Um, which is looking at um, how to navigate or coordinate routes advised to multiple vehicles. Um, ideally, you'd have all vehicles being coordinated. Let's see if we get... In this animation, we show what happens when all cars will be led by ordinary navigation systems. One can see that cars get stuck in bottlenecks such as bridges or complex junctions. So the red area is where the congestion has occurred. All drivers choose stupidly a simple shortest path. Some cars are equipped with more advanced navigation systems. They get informed about the traffic jam and find alternative routes. But again, 
all cars take the same route. They again get stuck in traffic congestion. They are simply relocated to another street, another bottleneck. Alternative routes are chosen isolated, be it by humans or separate navigation devices. They are not aware of all devices and decisions. Let's switch to an ideal system. Our agreement system knows every single car's position in its park location. It distributes all vehicles uniformly on all streets so that the whole infrastructure's capacity is ideally engaged. Although Greenway cannot eliminate the infrastructure's deficiencies, Greenway actively avoids traffic congestion by utilizing commonly available <coughs> mobile devices and GPS and link them to the most advanced graph conversion algorithm running in the cloud. Okay, a bit of a advertising. There is that one. Um, the general principle is that whenever you're setting out on a journey, you notify the navigation system where you're off to. Um, so the system knows where it sent other cars, so it sends yours a different route, in effect. Um, so there's a number of simulations done in Beijing. They did it. Um, um, and with the cars taking the greenway routes, they, they double the speed, and they actually get there twice as, twice as, as quick and use a lot less fuel which is one key issue that we want to, to focus on. And the claim is that you only need about 10% of the drivers to, to, uh, to be running this for it to be really effective in, in spreading out um, the traffic. So this is the, the Greenway um, system sitting in a car with the visor, and it will advise you two possible routes, alternative routes, the, the shortest path route, the naive one, where you get stuck in the, in the jam, and a special Greenway route, and you pay a few cents and, and you can choose way route um, and that saves you more than the, the cost of choosing the route. The technology required is really simple shortest path. It's, it's not such a hard one. Um, of course um, it's not that throughout the journey all the roads that, that, that um, all the road segments that will be occupied so there will be a time dependence on the occupancy but an ad adapted shortest path is going to be able to, to compute the optimal routes um, which avoid those um, congestions and keep people going on different paths. So the next um, solution I want to look at is improved public transport. So let's get rid of the congestion by having fewer vehicles on the road. There are two basic reasons. One is congestion and the other is reduced um, pollution, reduced CO2 output. Um, the kind of definitive example is the city of Curitiba in Brazil where they really started to, to busify the whole city um, from the 1970s. And um, they've made only routes, some of the roads only. They've made highly sophisticated um, bus stops where you can pay as you arrive at the bus stop rather than paying as you get onto the bus. So you get buses every 90 seconds on, on the main routes. There's a huge bus network. And the result is that 75% of the, the travel in Curitiba is by bus. So it's, it's similar to, a, to an underground system, but just one heck of a lot cheaper. So you can actually run it on the surface instead of digging tunnels all around the city. So the problem, and I'm going to take a, another video from the Greenway guys. Let me get our little. I want to introduce you to Otto. Well, better to Otto's car. Otto commutes with his car every single day. His average, not so shiny car, consumes about seven liters of fuel per 100 kilometers. So this is also aimed at an American audience. audience. That equals 33 miles per gallon. On his daily way, Otto is often stuck in traffic jams. Meanwhile, his car produces about 2.5 tons of toxic CO2 every year, just by a wasting lifetime caused by traffic congestion. 2.5 tons of CO2 might be pretty hard to imagine. Let's look at it from a biological point of view. A tree would take approximately 80 years to absorb one single ton of carbon oxygen. The other way around, you already need 80 grown trees to absorb one ton in one year. In Otto's case, 2.5 tons of CO2 would utilize a forest of 200 trees. Germans waste about 288 million liters of fuel every single year produced just by traffic congestion. They need a forest that is three times as large as Sydney in order to compensate this incredible pollution. However, that might still sound to Google. 
But look at the whole world. We need a vast forest, bigger than Australia. More trees than kangaroos and sheep together. <laughs> so congestion, that's just the cost of congestion. That's, that's not just road transport, that's congestion itself. So beyond zero emissions, um, are looking at um, trying to get people onto public transport. So just looking at the, the um, consumption of different engines and buses and things and the occupancy. Um, and then working out if we can get um, more people onto public transport, how much um, can we save in terms of CO2 output? So it's possible to, to build a network covering the whole of Melbourne uh, with buses coming every 10 minutes at every stop. And that would only need a, a thing in the size of the bus fleet, so it's quite realistic. Um, and if that kind of can be expected to lead to at least a 10% increase in um, take up of public, which would save about 200 million liters of fuel per year. 100,000 tons of CO2 would not be pumped into the atmosphere. Another aspect of improving public transport is um, to be able to adapt the behavior of the public transport to the people rather than people having to adapt to the public transport. So when there is a delay, then um, if there's an awful lot of people who need the connection, then the next the train or bus is going to be also delayed so that people can make the connection. And if there aren't enough people making the connection, then the system advises people of the new routes that they should take, uh, taking into account um, everybody's origin destination requirement. So nowadays, when you're trying to go on public transport, you can go onto the PTV site and say, I want to get from here to there. Um, all that happens is that in the future, that can be um, taken into account by the public transport providers, um, as long as it's an integrated <laughs> service. We did a, a little study of, of delay and the impact of delay just in the, on the Sandringham line. Now, we didn't worry about the connection to the next train, just looking at a, a, a single line just to see what you can do um, in a, with a very narrow purview of what's happening. So here we've got a 10-minute delay, and the, the next trains are naively just postponed until there's a, as long as there's enough headway for them to, to um, proceed. So it results in a total of 3,000 minutes of passenger delay on a sounding in line on a typical morning based on the arrival rates. Now, all you can do is you can optimize the response to that delay, make sure that uh, you don't skip the same station twice in a row and so on, and you can actually save 1,100 of those delayed passenger minutes, so just by more intelligent handling of the delay. Now, there are currently motivations for the um, uh, service providers to minimize delay, but it's actually delay to trains, so it doesn't motivate this kind of saving. And if you actually minimize the delay as measured for the penalties to the providers, they don't get that kind of saving. So you need to actually orient the optimization around passenger demand and not around the scheduled system. Another aspect of uh, adapting transport to um, the requirements, currently we have request bus stops, so if there's a, nobody requesting a stop, then the bus doesn't stop. But we want to be much more ambitious about that, and uh, so if our bus routes require passengers to communicate their request, then the bus route itself can be adapted to, to that request. And this is a, a research program being carried out um, with support from John, who's somewhere in the audience. I can't see him anywhere. There he goes. Thank you, John. <laughs> um, so the vision is to actually get the bus service to adapt to everybody's origin destination demands so as to get a much more efficient and quick service for the general public. The next advance enhancement really is uh, around communication. So there's communication really from vehicle to vehicle, um, which is really all about safety. Um, so essentially, 80% uh, of crash scenarios around unimpaired drivers um, could be addressed by vehicle to vehicle communication. Um, you can get warnings um, in terms of what's happening around you. Plus, you can have warnings from the side of the road. So, vehicle to roadside communication can help you understand what's happening in terms of school zones and, um, in particular, traffic light control. So, I want to actually now have a look at the impact of vehicle com communication on traffic lights.
this project considers once most cars on the road are autonomous, whether we can do better than that by way of AI-based coordination mechanisms. In this research, we introduced a new multi-agent intersection control scheme, specifically designed for autonomous vehicles. Terrifying sight. <laughs> Do you trust that? It's quite exciting. <laughs> so the Texas team are looking at, at um, how you can kind of migrate towards that kind of ideal scenario as you've got a, a larger and larger percentage of the, the cars being automated. So you have a traffic light, you have traffic signals controlling the driven cars, and then you have a, a, a period when the automated cars can get through. Um, and you can still get a lot of benefits when you've got a mixed um, automation and non-automation. Um, things start to improve already with, um, I think it doesn't have to be more than about, um, again, 10 or 15% being automated to get some improvement. And uh, as, you auto as you say, right, I'm going to allow my car to be automated, you can get a, a much better and better service. So there's an encouragement to allow people to let the car take over the control. So going on to automated vehicle control itself, um, which is the kind of prerequisite for that, there's a, um, been a European project for some few years now, looking at platooning. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Sorry. Let me just stop that. I like this guy. I don't know how he makes a cup of coffee in the car, but it's quite impressive. So it, it's really about to getting governments to, to approve of, of um, adding, allowing automated vehicles onto the highway. And, and actually, this is, this is um, coming to fruition now. So uh, um, Nevada already agreed to trials, and now it's gone on to California and Florida, I think, have also agreed to um, automated vehicles being tried on a public highway. But I wanted to now talk about not platooning, but individual automated vehicles. So this is a fairly old video from Sebastian Trun. Any street in California, you've driven 140,000 miles. Our cars have sensors, and we can imagine you can see everything around them and make decisions about every aspect of driving. The perfect driving system. We've driven in cities like in San Francisco here. We've driven from San Francisco to Los Angeles in either one. <coughs> Now, I can't get my friend Carl back to life, but I can become involved in these designs. You know that driving accidents are the number one cause of death for young people. Did you realize that almost all of those are due to human error and not machine error? Well, can that be prevented? Do you realize that? 
that he could change the capacity of highways by a factor of, of two or three if he didn't rely on the human precision and staying in the lane, and on the body precision, and there was by the limits of the area, and the limits of the area, and do away with all traffic jams on highways? Yeah, that'd be nice. <laughs> Yeah, so that's a, um, a vision of the future. Um, technologically, we're, we're getting pretty close to being able to do it. So there's a lot of pl political issues around that. Um, so the final issue I wanted to say to address was just freight transport. We haven't mentioned freight transport up to now. Um, no fancy videos for this one. Um, I just wanted to give a simple illustration um, of uh, delivering um, from a a depot to a bunch of, of clients. And so this is the, the classic traveling salesman problem. What's the shortest route from my depot to, to all my customers? Um, pretty much that the number of um, locations visited by the truck in a day is, is not that many. So you don't have to solve a very huge traveling salesman problem. Um, and you can actually solve that reasonably easily. I suppose it's when you've got a fleet of 200 trucks and 2,000 customers, it's a bit harder but there is a lot of technology available to do that. But what we've been looking at more recently is how to integrate multiple supply chains together. So rather than having separate um, delivery for the blue customers and for the red customers, the idea is that we can introduce a transfer point so as to allow the red deliverer and the blue deliverer to actually go to the transfer point and swap material so that the, the blue driver can pick up some red deliveries and the red driver can pick up some blue deliveries and then the red driver can stick to places near home and the blue driver can stick to places near home as well. So in this case the savings that achieve uh, from a, a, a typical optimization for a classic fleet scheduling might be 5 to 10 percent but here you're looking at 20 to 30 percent that you can save by integrating the supply chains. Okay and that's 30% of carbon emissions saved as well. So that's the complete list of things that I wanted to cover of kind of enhancements that you can make. So if we can save 20 plus, plus 10 plus 50 plus 30 plus 30, we've uh, got negative amount of traffic on our, on our roads. <laughs> uh, I suppose we can split them things up into cars on urban roads and, and uh, traffic junctions. And so looking at the area of least saving just on the urban roads, then, um, so we're going to save 30% on the, on the freight, so that's 0.7 of the freight that remains. We're going to save 20% on the coordinated vehicle routing and 10% on the improved public transport, so that's 0.8 times 0.9. So we're going to get about down, if we just apply these techniques, kind of mathematically, about two thirds of the current congestion is what we can aim at. So I think we can really take some, some reasonable steps to, to address congestion um, by combining a bunch of different methods um, without building $15 billion worth of, of new highway. Thanks very much for listening, and I'm sorry this is quite a, a, a simple view of uh, <laughs> the problem, um, but I hope it was valuable for some of you. People want to ask some questions? Yeah. So if you get there fast, you need more parking capacity. So if, if cars arrive kind of faster at the destination, I suppose you could, you're saying there's, there's a pile-up at the entrance to the car park kind of thing. So there's a, there's a risk, yes, exactly that, that, that uh, if you can make it faster to get to your destination, you say, oh, let's live further out of town. I reckon I can spend 50 minutes on my commute, so if I, if I get there faster, I'll just live 100, 100 kilometers out instead of 50 kilometers out. There's certainly a risk of that. Um, the platooning on the highways is, is, I think, quite a 
if that can actually be effective, uh, I don't know how many of you came down the, the highway, um, the M1, this evening and, and were crawling along um, with a bit of platooning, that could be really relieved um, without causing extra congestion at, in, at, at Monash University Clayton. I think that there, there was already too much demand at the beginning, if you like. So it's not just that they, they, they weren't slowing them down by funneling them on, but there were so many cars already coming out of the city. Um, to, to hold you back all the way back. So if you take a wide enough view, you, you prevent people coming over the Westgate Bridge and, and going through the Burnley Tunnel, then in principle, yes, you can actually keep keep the whole M1 flowing all the time, even at rush hour. But it would require you to do more dramatic things up at the other end than are currently done. I don't know if it, I would say possible. <laughs> You'd end up with cars queuing on the Westgate or something, which, which is not kind of realistic. It's a question of where you can block them, yes, that's right. I think. But they're blocked anyway on the on the road, as you say. So it's, it's um, not a problem. You do need a notion of fairness. <laughs> so really, if, I mean, uh, it's quite a key point is that every single ramp must have a, a traffic signal. So that was one of the key things that, that, that was essential. Um, we can't take tra traffic signals all the way back out to Geelong. I mean that hasn't, so it's, it's only within Melbourne. So we, we have got this problem about, about um, the inflow. And if you wanted to be fair, yeah, we're bound to let some, some cars on locally. So we're, we're kind of stuck with the situation that now is until we've got everything completely managed throughout the whole length of the motorway. Yes, I, I, mean, I, think, I think it's worth answering that question. So, so we've been looking at um, Delhi, Beijing and, and uh, Melbourne and, and looking at ways to um, um, change the um, mode choice for people in order to improve health. Um, and so we've been looking at what would happen if you could uh, encourage um, for 20% of journeys less than five kilometers to be done by walking and other methods of, of uh, having more um, mixed uh, land use um, so as to have more people making shorter journeys. And looking at Delhi and Beijing, that had a positive effect on health. Looking at Melbourne, it appeared to have a negative effect on health because you increase the number of people walking and bicycling and they all get run over and, and hit by cars. Um, so in order to make that work, what you have to have is mode separation. So it really makes sense that we need mode separation in order to increase the health in all, all the other ways and make sure that this does not have a negative effect. But as soon as you've got mode separation, you're segmenting part of the road for a bicycle lane and part for, 
pedestrian, you'd really like to keep pedestrians and bicycles separate. So the amount of space available for cars is reduced. And if you've got actually better management of the cars, we could actually get the same amount of traffic through on less road space. So we could actually have mode separation if we use some of these other technologies to get the traffic through on a less road space. So I think the things fit together, but it would require quite a lot of investment, of course. To, to, and political initiative to say, let's, let's actually take this piece of road and reduce the amount of lanes available to, to cars. That, that's, a, that's a brave step by any politician. I didn't, no, no. Um, and, and now that you, if you've got tracking of where the cars are, you can charge by location and by time and actually space out traffic very effectively. And I think that's, that is going to be a way forward. It's going to be a crucial way forward. I should have mentioned it, absolutely. Yeah. Was that, uh, that's what you were suggesting, was it? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, so, so you'd have um, um, phases for uh, single routes for, for, the, for the cars which are driven, and then phases for the automated vehicle as well. Oh, sorry, on the routes are you talking about, not at the junction. So on the routes, you want, you want to have a mix. So you, you've got to have a legal framework within which you can have automated vehicles and drivers mixing. So. So one possible approach, and, and uh, we've got a lot of experts here who would say the different ways of actually um, combining the traffic is to have a particular lane reserved for automated vehicles, so that uh, it, it appeared to be the case in here that you switch into a particular lane. Um, yes, yes, so then you've got less lanes available for the non-automated vehicles, exactly that. So I, th I think what you're after is, is a completely mixed, where you don't have to reserve a lane for the automated vehicles, where um, there is a legal framework for automated vehicles to be just driving along with driver-driven vehicles, and um, then you can get the benefit of automation without actually se segmenting the traffic. And you still get benefit, because the automated vehicles can still go very close to each other. Um, to what extent they can go close to the driven vehicles, that would depend a lot of, of, on the technology available and again, that's <laughs> you've got some yeah. so the the, the freight um, supply chain stuff is um, immediately implementable, although it requires, um, from a commercial point of view, people to lose control over their own supply chain. So there's quite an issue in terms of encouraging that and providing some sort of government support, some sort of government insurance system to make that realistic or commercial for the, for the drivers. Um, for the bus network, I, again, I think that's something that you, you don't have to do it for the whole of Melbourne straight away, but you can uh, address that incrementally and get some value out of that quite quickly. Those will be two things. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, yeah, so I did, yeah. Yes, absolutely, and, and, and get the numbers out of the Broadmeadows one I didn't know, but yeah, that'd be very good. I'll, I'll follow up on that, if, uh, I think that'd be.
Yes, yes, and... and